Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends of uh, Just Transition, it is uh, my great pleasure on behalf of Commissioners Elisa Ferreira and Kadri Simpson to welcome you all to this fourth meeting of the Just Transition platform. A lot has happened since last April when we last uh, met. Um, very notably, um, the European climate law came into force in July. And through that, we as Europe um, committed legally to become climate neutral by 2050 and to reduce carbon emissions by at least 55% already by 2030. Secondly, all the legal elements of the just transition mechanism have also been put in place, meaning that we are now equipped to accompany the transition uh, with at least 55 billion of targeted support to the regions most uh, affected. Thirdly, the Commission has also in July put forward proposals in order to concretely organize the reduction of emissions by 2030. This is known as the uh, Fit for 55 uh, package. And of course, last week, we had the latest um, conference on climate, COP26 in Glasgow. All these elements point to one stark reality, the urgency of action. We need definitely to accelerate the transition in order to meet our targets already by 2030. But in order to do that, we need to put people and communities at the center of our thinking and of our actions. Unfortunately, Commissioner Ferreira could not be with us today, but she has asked me to convey to you four key messages on her behalf. The first message is that indeed there is no time to waste. No time to waste to set up the territorial just transition plans which will be underpinning uh, our just transition action. A lot has already happened on this, but we need to go the last mile. And why so? Because looking at past transitions, the lessons which we can draw is that we have all to gain by getting ahead of the change. Secondly, we need to make sure that territorial just transition plans are comprehensive strategies. What do I mean by that? By that, I mean that the starting point has to be a clear transition trajectory. Secondly, it has to identify fully the economic and social implications of that transition. And thirdly, on that basis, it has to indicate which comprehensive actions will be taken. And that not just under the Just Transition Fund, but also under the two other financing pillars of the Just Transition Mechanism. Thirdly, for the Just Transition Mechanism, and specifically the Just Transition Fund, fund to be effective, it has to come as an additional and specific targeted element to what cohesion policy does in the different regions of Europe. It cannot be seen as something which would warrant in any way a reduction of normal cohesion policy support in those uh, regions. And finally, fourth but essential message, I was talking before about 
putting people and communities at the center, well, the best way to secure that is to draw them in and to listen to their aspirations, to their ideas on how to shape that transition in the best ways. We need to go for serious, inclusive, participatory processes with the local communities and involving also the young generations, the one which have the energy, the ones which have an open mind, uh, and the ones which are the most entrepreneurial. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure uh, to invite us all uh, to listen to Commissioner Kendry Simpson on her own messages to all of us today. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to talk to you today on the next step of the Just Transition Platform journey. First of all, let me wish you a very warm welcome to the meeting today. I have always said that phasing out coal will not be easy. We know it is a delicate exercise, balancing considerations of security of supply with affordability and social fairness. And the current context with high energy prices makes things even more challenging. But it also makes it even more urgent to act and reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. At the same time, always present in the overarching context of social fairness and justice. This should be the lens through which we view all of these considerations. So today, in the spirit of looking through that lens, I want to mention three things. Progress made so far, the current energy markets situation and my takeaways from COP26. So, beginning with the progress made so far in some of our most coal-reliant member states in the past few months. I was delighted to see Romania and Bulgaria starting to discuss a timely coal phase-out. Both countries have agreed to discuss a timeline and technical options with the relevant stakeholders to define the best way forward. One, that secure security of supply affordability and social concerns and complies with EU energy and climate objectives. Romania will work with a timeline to phase out coal by 2032 and Bulgaria towards the end of the 2030 decade. These processes will be supported by the EU recovery package. I would also like to commend Croatia and Slovenia on adopting a coal phase out date 2033. The date requires early planning to make sure that Croatia and Slovenia are ready in time. I understand that Czechia will soon follow. Discussions are also continuing in Poland, where the challenge is of course of a greater nature. I was very happy to see the Polish government sign up to the COP26 statement about phasing out coal in the 2030s or shortly thereafter. This means that, as of now, there is not a single EU country that has not yet started to reflect on the phase out of coal. Most have already adopted a concrete phase out plan. This is very positive news. It also re reflects the rapid pace of progress on the ground. In our coal regions, increase in Spain, in Czechia, and in Poland, where we see a real willingness to come together in a constructive way and propose concrete solutions for a gradually goal-free future. At the EU level, things are moving fast as well. Over the, over the summer, the Commission released a comprehensive package of new laws, initiatives and instruments to implement the Green Deal. Just Transition is at the center of this package. First, we have proposed to upgrade our energy efficiency and clean energy legislation to adapt 
it to our new level of ambition. That means greater protection for our most vulnerable consumers and those in energy poverty. We have proposed a new instrument, the Social Climate Fund. This fund will use the future revenue from carbon pricing to provide support to vulnerable consumers and microenterprises for building renovations, access to clean transport and, when needed, temporary direct income support. This new instrument would kick in just in time to take the relay of EU-supported recovery programmes, which will start phasing out by 2025. Finally, the Commission is now working on a set of recommendations on the social and labour effects of the transition. We aim to publish these recommendations by the end of the year. They will serve as guidance to Member States, notably on how to anticipate and accompany change in the skills of our workforce and how to modernise our social systems. The second topic I want to touch upon is the current situation on the energy markets. I hear some say that it calls for a pause in the green transition. Let me be clear, it does not. Rolling out clean energy and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels is the best way to protect ourselves from such external shocks. We have to help most vulnerable consumers pay their energy bills this winter. The Commission is fully aware of this. This is why a month ago we published a toolbox that identifies short-term fixes and possible medium to long-term measures to mitigate risk in the future. Third and finally, some reflections on COP26. From what I witnessed in Glasgow, a fair and just transition was high on the negotiation agenda and front of mind for many. While there, the EU endorsed a statement on the phase out of coal, by which we committed to a coal free energy mix in the 2030s or shortly thereafter. This also calls on us to plan the transition with an increased sense of urgency. We can only ensure a just transition if we do the transition in time. A rushed transition will not be a fair one. The EU also signed a political declaration on the importance to step up action on just transition globally. In our cooperation programmes with third countries, Europe cannot push for it alone. The just transition is a powerful catalyst and we will reinforce its support to third countries. We have signed up a partnership with South Africa, along with France, Germany, the United States and the UK. Together, we will mobilise up to $8.5 billion. We will boost exchanges with third countries under the Just Transition platform and in meetings like this one. First, beginning with coal regions, where we have the most major experience, but our intention is to also cover carbon-intensive regions in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have given you a flavour today of where we are coming from, where we are and where we are going when it comes to the Just Transition. Thank you very much for your relentless efforts and continued commitment. I wish you a productive event and inspiring conversations. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Balbina Glusa and I'm working in DG Regio on Just Transition with special focus on Just Transition platform. Today, I have a pleasure to be here in studio with uh, my Director General, Marc Lemaitre, and uh, with you, dear participants, online. Uh, and I'm here to ask questions to Mark. These questions were submitted by some of you in advance before the Just Transition Platform event by email. But uh, now you have also opportunity to put your questions online via the live chat box in Swapcard. 
So please do so. And if you have any questions you always wanted to ask on Just Transition platform and Just Transition process, please feel free now to ask them. This is the great opportunity. And we can also challenge a bit Mark with our questions. So let's start with the first questions we have received. The first question is uh, from one participant. I have heard from some that the JTF is like a Yeti. Everyone has heard about it, but no one has seen it. Do you agree, Mark, with this tricky question? Have you seen Yeti? Well, thank you for this uh, first challenge, <laughs> Belvina. Um, well, um, I would like it to be like this. Uh, I am not sure that uh, as uh, of today, um, everyone has heard about the Just Transition Fund and the Just Transition Mechanism. But I certainly count on everyone and certainly on the participants um, of the Just Transition platforms uh, to um, convey uh, this message that uh, the EU is very, very much focused uh, on ensuring that uh, our climate ambitions are going hand in hand with ensuring uh, that everyone receives the right support uh, for that uh, transition. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, I certainly uh, believe that, uh, yes, there is still quite a bit to do in order to move from um, this uh, vision we have to reality on the ground, to really making a difference, to really ensuring that people are helped, that communities are helped to shape the transition and to go through it in the best possible way. Uh, and here um, I would repeat uh, my, my message. We, we really need to uh, accelerate um, the putting into place uh, of the elements of the just transition mechanism, uh, first and foremost, the territorial just transition plans. There is some movement on this. We have received two territorial just transition plans uh, by now, which we are examining uh, as we speak. Um, but overall, we are expecting more than 40 of them. So there is clearly quite a way to go. I do hope that with the technical support that has been uh, offered um, over this year, um, we will be able together to very quickly uh, have these territorial just transition plans in place and to launch concrete uh, support uh, actions in the uh, selected uh, regions. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very useful clarifications. Um, the next question um, is um, about the updates which uh, Commissioner uh, Simpson shared uh, about the call phase out in different member states. I wanted to ask you how important this is for the programming of the Just Transition Fund. Well, um... First, I, um, I have been very positively surprised by uh, the um, information shared by Commissioner Simpson. I must say that I was uh, not aware uh, that so many additional member states uh, had um, become quite concrete on um, defining for themselves um, a date of final exit from uh, coal production. This is excellent news and this is essential news. Um, for coal producing regions, um, very clearly uh, one um, element of the contract between on the one hand European taxpayers and on the other coal producing regions is that support from the Just Transition Mechanism and specifically from the Just Transition Fund 
must be accompanied by um, a clear step in the direction of moving out of coal production. And um, this is why uh, this uh, news shared by Commissioner Simpson is so uh, welcome. Um, we seem to see now um, that part of uh, the um, uh, quid pro quo uh, to be uh, fulfilled by member states. Uh, and uh, again, this should uh, be inscribed in the territorial just transition plans. Uh, and this is uh, then the sound basis on which uh, to uh, roll out just transition fund support. Thank you. But we also heard that some member states want to achieve the climate neutrality at its own uh, pace. Do you think it's it's enough? Um, what is absolutely clear uh, is that um, the EU is not dictating uh, final exit dates, uh, notably for coal production. And this, I think, is uh, abundantly illustrated uh, by the diversity of the dates which have been mentioned uh, by Commissioner Simpson. But certainly uh, there is one common element which all member states have subscribed to, and that is the European climate law I have referred to. Uh, we have there two very uh, clear aims, one for 2030, one for 2050, and there will be one for 2040 still to be uh, determined. Um, what is uh, obvious is that um, these two aims for 2030 and 2050 cannot be achieved if um, some member states were to suggest, for instance, uh, that um, they would wait before they would take any any action. Um, so the overall framework and the overall collective ambition, uh, which member states have all subscribed to, has of course also to be taken into account. But again, from the uh, uh, dates and specific years we have heard uh, um, mentioned by Commissioner Simpson, I think that this is a, a, a welcome um, confirmation that all member states are in fact taking uh, these collective commitments very seriously and are willing to contribute to achieving them. Thank you. I, I think it was uh, very clear. Uh, actually, we have already in the chat uh, questions related to this part. Uh, I will couple uh, these um, by asking if the transition should not be rushed, why does part of the JTF need to be committed by the end of 2023? Um, who said that the transition, transition should not be rushed? Um, I um, would certainly repeat that um, today we are not pursuing the climate transition at a pace which is um, um, required to achieve our 2030 goals. We have just increased our ambition for 2030. We had until now aimed for minus 40%. Now we aim for minus 55%. Have we drawn all the consequences of that increased goal? Not yet. And this is why the Commission has put on the table a comprehensive package in order to secure achieving this minus 55% goal. What is obvious uh, to me and I assume to everyone is that we do need to accelerate. We do need to raise our game. 
And there again, I would just call on not forgetting the hard lessons of the past. When we were not prepared for um, some structural profound change in one or the other of our industries, take textiles, take shipbuilding, take even steel. Well, this led to very, very serious and damaging social consequences. So the lesson is clear. We need to be on the ball early. We need to be ahead of the curve. We need to anticipate on these changes. And let's go back, taking these exit dates, which member states are now individually contemplating. I mean, all those specific years, they are tomorrow. And this is why really we have to mobilize as fast as we can the Just Transition Fund and beyond that, the Just Transition Mechanism means these minimum 55 billion I have talked about as fast as we can. This is, I think, a uh, collective responsibility, uh, which everyone I am sure is taking very, very seriously. I mean, next to that, there is something which today might sound like a bit like a detail, uh, but which should also um, uh, make us, um, for a financial reason, uh, concentrate uh, on action as fast as possible. And it is that indeed, more than half of the Just Transition Fund means will have to be deployed before mid 2026. And this is not even tomorrow. This is really today. So there is really no time to lose. I think um, both if we care about um, making a positive difference for the community's most concerns, but also if we care about mobilizing all the means which are put at the disposal through uh, the EU budget. Thank you, Mark. Um, and speaking about no time to lose, um, we got a question linked to that. Um, should the JTF continue after 2030? Huh. <laughs> um, well, this is uh, certainly not for me <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to decide. Um, this is something uh, which um, we will have uh, to contemplate um, as uh, the European Commission when we will be designing proposals uh, for uh, the EU budget beyond 2027. Um, but certainly there is one point I would want to make. Uh, the transition will not be over, neither by 2027 nor by 2030. There will be a lot ahead of us when we are at that time. And certainly we will not at that point in time have overcome all the economic and social challenges related to transition. Now, what should therefore be our collective ambition? Our collective ambition should be to demonstrate between now and the time when the Commission has to make proposals on the future, that yes, the Just Transition Fund and the Just Transition Mechanism are an appropriate tool, an effective tool, one which brings exactly the results which we are dreaming of. And this once more suggests that we need action and we need action very fast in order to have a compelling case for continuing the Just Transition Fund. 
Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and now um, I wanted to ask questions uh, which were submitted before to us. Um, as we know, the JTF will not only support cold regions, but also carbon intensive regions. Uh, and this afternoon we will launch uh, four new working groups on this topic. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you why uh, these groups uh, are important, actually. Why do we do it? Um, well, um, I think it is important to recognize that um, when focusing on just transition, our first angle was to look specifically at coal producing regions uh, and at also regions producing other fossil fuels like oil shale uh, because it was obvious uh, from the start uh, that a lot of change was coming to those regions. And it is only somewhat later that we have woken up to um, what the climate transition would mean for carbon intensive industries, as they are called. And these carbon intensive industries are also concentrated in certain parts of the EU territory. Um, and when it comes to carbon intensive industries, there are certainly two dimensions to it. One is that um, there is a technological challenge in order to transform these industries, to decarbonize these industries, uh, to such an extent that um, they would have a sustainable future. And here, of course, um, we can think uh, for certain of them either of a full electrification of their processes or uh, of um, uh, switching to a fuel which would be, for instance, green hydrogen. Having mentioned this, um, it is clear that today we don't yet have um, off-the-shelf ready-made solutions of this uh, type and therefore uh, focusing on the fast evolving landscape on carbon uh, reducing technologies is very important. But then there is also this second dimension, which is the human dimension, not only for coal producing regions, but also for carbon intensive regions. And here, the uh, four working groups that we are uh, kickstarting through this meeting of the Just Transition platform um, should be uh, also allowing, uh, enabling uh, the right interaction uh, with notably um, this, the main stakeholders, uh, representatives of workers in those, um, in those uh, industries. Uh, and here we, we are talking mainly and uh, the four um, working groups um, uh, specificities um, demonstrate that uh, of the steel sector, of the chemical sector and um, uh, also, um, I forgot the last one now. Horizontal um, stakeholders. No, no, wait, there's a third. Uh, Chemicals, um, steel and cement. And cement, of course. How could I forget? Um, yes, thank you, Mark. Indeed, we will uh, have uh, also a session uh, officially launching these four uh, working groups just directly after our opening session. I will come to that uh, a bit later um, uh, during our meeting. But uh, when we are speaking now about the agenda, I wanted to ask you 
uh, why actually we are including a session on trans transatlantic dialogue uh, in the in the event. Well, um, as Europeans, we um, like to believe that um, we have a more sensitive social court, that uh, we are the ones at the forefront of reflections uh, on social justice. And with the just transition, we are in the middle of that, obviously. Um, well, without um, uh, downplaying what I believe is indeed at the core of our um, European social market economy model, still, we should also remain open to learn from others um, how they approach the social dimension of climate action and of uh, transition. And this is why we thought it was important uh, to start a dialogue with partners from the United States and partners from Canada. Uh, they will be facing similar uh, challenges to ours. We were talking about coal. Uh, we were talking about carbon intensive industries. We have today very similar economic structures on both sides of the uh, Atlantic from that point of view. Uh, and therefore, um, this is an opportunity uh, to learn from each other uh, what our present state of uh, thinking is uh, and to enrich each other's uh, views. Thank you. I, I agree that the transatlantic dialogue is, is also crucial, but um, let's maybe check also the questions in the chat now because I see that it's very lively. And um, we have a question on territorial just transition plans. So back to, to our member states. Who is in charge of elaborating the territorial just transition plans? It would seem logical that for place-based plans, local and regional governments be on the driving seat to set up these plans. Um, I would agree. Where, sorry? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, of course, uh, the um, administrative structures uh, within the member states um, um, uh, allow for that. Uh, I say this because um, there are significant differences uh, in the uh, level of decentralization uh, of economic policy making and in particular uh, of deciding on uh, investments, public investments of deciding on uh, support uh, to uh, private enterprise, of deciding on uh, support for skilling, reskilling, upskilling of uh, the labor force. And all this, of course, should be taken into account um, uh, in order to uh, ensure uh, that uh, just transition means uh, would uh, be uh, handled uh, most effectively. But independently of state structures, uh, what is obvious, and that brings me back to uh, one of the key messages of Commissioner Ferreira, is that territorial just transition plans should not be developed in an ivory tower somewhere in a state capital. The pen holder can be in the capital, depending again on the administrative structure, but um, the pen holder must be in dialogue with the um, regions concerned. And this is uh, for sure uh, the public authorities in those regions, uh, which can be uh, municipalities, which can be uh, regions as such, 
Um, and this must be as well uh, the stakeholders in those regions, representing um, employers' organizations, representing uh, workers' organizations, representing civil society organizations, and as I said, also uh, representing the young generations in uh, those um, in those territories, uh, where the administrative structures allow, of course, we are um, pushing for the um, uh, entrusting of just transition fund means and of the design of territorial just transition plans uh, at the territorial level. But let us not forget either we were talking about um, exit dates for coal production. These are decisions which are always taken at national level uh, and therefore um, territorial just transition plans also require um, because they need to be in sync with the overall transition strategy of a member state. They require uh, to have uh, the right uh, coherence with um, these national objectives, uh, which are set at national level. Thank you, Mark. Uh, actually, I have a question linked to that, what you said about the stakeholder engagement at different levels. Um, it's coming from um, one participant um, and sent um, beforehand. And the question is as follows. Um, the executive vice president Timmerman said that the European Green Deal is going to be just or there is just not going to be a European Green Deal. Making a just transition without winning workers' support seems improbable. Does the Commission plan to include workers' co-determination and other forms of workers' participation at company level in the European Green Deal to institutionally strengthen workers' voice in the process? I already emphasized how important it is uh, to have a participatory process um, to shape the use which is being made uh, of just transition fund means. Um, and this very centrally um, requires the involvement of uh, representatives uh, of workers and certainly uh, in depending on the types of regions we are talking about, um, we of course expect workers of the most concerned sectors in those regions uh, to be uh, well represented and heard in that context. Um, the question you put seems to be also looking at um, decisions uh, which individual companies are facing on um, uh, how to adjust to uh, our climate agenda. Uh, here, I do think that uh, we have uh, very um, strong European legislation, which ensures that, uh, especially for large companies, and we are talking in those uh, carbon intensive sectors, uh, mostly of large companies, um, fundamental strategic decisions which are being taken uh, require some form of consultation uh, of staff. Now, we do not intend to change this, but I think that this is one of the lessons um, which we have drawn at European level from uh, the past. Um, I, I was mentioning some transitions which have been more traumatic. Uh, it is following uh, one massive um, uh, uh, layoff plan which was decided by Renault, if I remember well, uh, at the end of the 1990s or beginning of the 2000s, which in fact led to the latest uh, European legislation in that context to ensure that um, uh, workers uh, are uh, consulted before fundamental decisions 
uh, at the level of individual companies. Thank you, Mark. Um, I hope you still have uh, power to reply for next questions because they, they, there is a wave <laughs> coming. Um, next question uh, from the chat. Uh, is there any thinking of extending the JTP to other affected territories and sectors that were not foreseen by the JTF regulation? For instance, the automotive sector. What should, would you say to that? The question, if I understood it correctly, is uh, about um, the Just Transition platform and um, um, for which uh, topics it should um, uh, open its, uh, its arms. Um, as um, we could recall uh, through the different questions put, the Just Transition platform um, is not cast in stone and we are enlarging its uh, remit now with the transatlantic dialogue with the four working groups we have uh, uh, referred to and um, uh, I would uh, certainly um, uh, reassure that this openness um, is uh, not a one-off and we will continue uh, to uh, look at legitimate themes uh, which would benefit from discussions in a framework uh, like the one of the uh, Just Transition uh, platform. Uh, and the automotive industry undoubtedly is uh, one industry which is not necessarily itself today uh, very carbon intensive. Um, if one um, neglects uh, the uh, the emissions of uh, the inputs to produce cars like steel, so that we uh, uh, we address uh, more directly. Um, but certainly, the uh, the car industry faces um, a technological challenge. Um, uh, in order to ensure uh, that uh, the cars produced uh, are indeed um, sustainable uh, in the uh, in the future, uh, so here I would um, I would um, uh, conclude that um, the car industry is certainly one uh, obvious candidate for further enlargement uh, of um, uh, the portfolio of um, uh, industries which are being looked at and discussed within the Just Transition platform. I absolutely agree and we will do our best. <laughs> and the next question um, is on gas. Uh, you were speaking about coherent transition strategies before. Some countries are still invest, investing in natural gas in the 2014-2020 programs. Is this in line with the overall logic? Um, well, let me start again by saying in that Brussels is not deciding on everything. And when it comes to energy security and the energy mix of member states, we are not dictating that. What we are um, ensuring, but through collective decisions, is that we reach our targets for 2030 and eventually uh, for 2050. Now, if we look at 2050, obviously gas being a fossil fuel, like many others, while being less carbon intensive than uh, coal, um, also has um, its days counted in the way we know it uh, today. But when it comes to securing a, an energy transition between now and 2050 and a pathway to climate uh, neutrality, we are not dictating in the details how this should be shaped by member states. 
Um, and this, I think, is also demonstrated by the fact that um, we will continue on a transitional basis to support, to allow for European support to investments in gas infrastructure. Although we will be looking for um, a uh, future proof uh, type of investment, for instance, which would allow uh, for the replacement of gas by hydrogen in um, the the infrastructure put uh, put in place. So this will be possible before beyond the fourteen twenty uh, period, uh, with uh, undoubtedly um, uh, financial uh, support uh, running at least until twenty twenty five uh, or even. Uh, slightly uh, beyond. So this demonstrates, I think, uh, that um, uh, at European level, uh, we are again not dictating to member states exactly uh, what uh, decisions to take uh, on their pathway or on their uh, short to medium term uh, energy mix. And we are also recognizing that gas has a role to play uh, for uh, still quite a number of years in the future. Thank you, Mark. I think it was very clear. Um, we have one more question on, uh, on the territorial just transition plans. Uh, what is the approval negotiation process of territorial just transition plans between the member state and the European Commission to be followed. How does it transpire and it, uh, is there any specific timeline deadlines? Um, well, let me start with the end. Um, there is no clear deadline, but there is a very fast ticking clock. I already emphasized that, um, and I will just repeat that um, as territorial just transition plans are the absolute precondition for uh, support under the just transition fund, and as more than half of the support under the just transition fund has to be mobilized before mid 2026, there is clearly an implicit timeline for the adoption of those territorial just transition plans. Um, our hope is that with the technical support which was offered this year and which was taken up by uh, a large majority of member states, we are very close now to mature territorial just transition plans. But I would want again to emphasize that these territorial just transition plans have to be comprehensive. They have to start from the transition goals of a member state. So the, um, um, the, the um, decarbonization pathway, which they have uh, decided upon, um, it has to include a clear analysis of the expected economic and social impact on the territories which would be targeted, and it has from there to define um, a convincing intervention logic in order to cushion off these economic and social uh, impacts. All this is essential, and I would even add to that that it is not just about the Just Transition Fund, but it is also about the two other pillars of the just transition mechanism. So also what would be contemplated, for instance, under the uh, public sector loan facility uh, should be uh, explicit in the territorial just transition plans. But I do hope that with the support we have offered, um, uh, most member states are by now very close to submitting to us a complete draft of these territorial just transition plans. And um, we will be uh, assessing 
uh, and moving towards approval of these plans exactly in the same way as we do uh, on uh, cohesion policy programs generally, i.e. if we see shortcomings, we will be sending observations to the member states concerned, um, uh, which uh, hopefully would then lead to uh, rapid improvements on the contents and that would allow then uh, us to uh, to adopt uh, these um, uh, these plans. Um, unfortunately, now we will have to wrap up the session. Thank you very much for this useful exchange, Mark. Uh, and I would like to invite all participants to the next session of the Just Transition Platform, which will start in around 30 minutes. So at 2.30, we will have two sessions uh, which will start in parallel. The session launching the Just Transition Platform Working Groups on Carbon Intensive Regions. Uh, and then the other session uh, will be on Coal Regions in Transition, updates on the initiative. So please grab your coffee and stay with us. Thank you. <laughs>